I just want to initially start, Julian, with um, how you actually started to film the public thing. I think it was from seeing Sex Pistols play one of the very early gigs, wasn't it? Well, actually, I saw them rehearsing in uh, Bermondsey. Um, at that time, you know, they closed the London dock, so it was a great place to go. It had just been shut down, so there were still ships and cranes rusting away, and it was this kind of weird desert in the middle of London, which had been like the beating heart of the city, was suddenly this eerie no man's land, and it was a great place to walk around, especially at the weekend where they, they weren't even taking it apart anymore. So, uh, yeah, I was walking around there one Sunday and heard this sound coming from a warehouse. Oh, it's just completely wind. random. Like it's only wind yeah. before they played a gig. <clears throat> so um, I saw them. It's a funny story. I saw them, you know, playing. I heard. I want you to know that I love you, baby. It sounded like small yeah. faces. And there's this warehouse door, open, rickety old wooden stairs, kind of old warehouse, get to the top floor and it's like worm's eye view looking out at this band kind of silhouetted against the windows of this kind of loft in the warehouse. And they didn't look right, they didn't sound right, they had spiky hair, a bit like you do. Mm. They, they had very narrow trousers, big squidgy feet. It's, like it's, a, great, it's a great look. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> Still going after all these years. Um, big kind of bee-like mohair jumpers from the shop. And they looked like bee men from outer space mm. or something, you know, like, and they were mashing up this song singing, I want you to know that I hate you, baby, rather love you. Mm. And it was one of those, you, you know, it's a fucking cliche, but I was like, whoa, this is, un, you know, unlike anything. So to, as it, a you know, yeah. the reaction that people had in clubs, I had in that warehouse, like, this is, jumping out of the future at you. And as somehow. a filmmaker, because you were at film college at that time. I was at college. So did this appeal to you as a filmmaker? I said, well, I was doing, trying to do a film about when I was at school and the small faces and the kinks were the bands I was into. So I, I said, when they had a break in mashing up this song, I said, would you do a, um, like a soundtrack for this five minute film that I'm doing? exercise at film school and like fuck off middle class cunt basically um subtext um but we're playing a gig we, you know they're saying they're going to play a gig and um i was just blown away by this the whole thing was kind of hyper real to me because it was so different from what was going on anywhere at the time and i went back to the squats here came back here <laughs> Where I was living in, uh, said to her, and I've just seen this amazing fucking band. You wouldn't believe what they're like, you know. And they said, What's their name? And I thought, oh, Fuck, I didn't ask their name, you know. <laughs> so for the next month, I was like, saying, the play a gig in the month. I was looking in all the music papers to try and work out a name of a band that might be playing a gig, and I, I couldn't find it. And then after about six weeks, after the month, anyway, soon after a month, I saw this name, Sex Pistols. I thought, that's got to be them at Central Art School. So I went to see them there. Oh, you went to the first one? Second one. Okay. Well, St. Martin's was the first one. Yeah, yeah. But then they played the Central oh, Art oh, School. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is where I saw them. And um, basically then I saw, you know, there were about 10 Bromley Contingent Sid, a few people like them in the crowd, and it was the most kind of theatrical fucking mm. anti-rock and roll type thing with all these long-haired guys throwing drink at them and stuff. It was great. And so I just thought, I've got to film this. Forget the 60s, um, you know, memory thing. So you went and got the college camera? Yeah, I had a key made so I could get the camera out, but then I had to smuggle it past Malcolm who didn't want anyone filming anything. So it was like taking it apart. We all, I had a couple of mates. And we'd, you know, unscrew the lenses and so the magazine. So you so filming it like this. Yeah. And then we'd put it back together in the toilet, the bog, and then get under a coat, try and get like, glimpses of the band until we were thrown out. But in the end, I persuaded Malcolm that we'd do it for nothing. You know, you'd get a film crew, a camera. All he had to do was pay for the film. Did this not appeal to him? He said, well, he, that, that yeah. flicked a switch in his mind. That but this thing was actually important enough to be documented. Well, he wouldn't have to pay anything for it. Oh, it's just <laughs> that that was as simple as that. Main yeah. response. <laughs> <laughs> because, 
Because the interesting about punk was it, it was so self-referential and so self-documented from a very early sort of stage, which you're very much part of, mm. by filming this stuff very, very early on. Yeah. Was there, was there a sense of that in there at that time? Well, from today's perspective, it was insane. There was no cameras in there. Very few still cameras and certainly no movie cameras. So, uh, yeah, it just seemed seemed to make sense to film it because no one else was filming mm. it, you know. Was it, was it a sense that you were filming, I mean, now it's history, isn't it? I mean, obviously then you couldn't tell it's going to be history. Well, I could, but the moment I saw them up that rickety you felt old this staircase, is be a big thing. Yeah. I thought, I've seen the future, you know. Uh, it was really, really impactful. Mm. And anyone who saw them, as you know, coming from Manchester, a number of people, thousands of people apparently saw them in Manchester at the yeah. Free Trade Hall <laughs> and all had the same reaction. <clears throat> yeah. And it's interesting the way you describe the way you saw it because you, you describe it in a very visual kind of way. And it's, I mean, of course, the music's really important and, and you're a big music fan. But is, it, is the visual aspect of it as important? And also the cultural context, which is also something you always verse in your films. Well, I, I certainly felt they were a rebel band, which has always interested me, you know, the, the singing about how they felt about their lives. You know, not necessarily in a very d direct, propagandist kind of way, but... There was certainly that aspect to it, which was really powerful, the righteous kind of anger uh, that, they, that they conveyed. And um, it also felt that there hadn't been a voice like that. You know, you talk about whether the Beatles are middle class or working class and how that shades in, but these guys were off the scale. They were kind of sub-criminal, mm. you know, living in beach huts in Hastings and sleeping in cars and, you know, it was a, it was a voice you hadn't heard on top of the pops <laughs> and you weren't going to hear this. Yeah, yeah. But, um, that was the exciting thing as well as the, the sense of, you know, creating your own kind of fashions and sounds and amusement and attitude to kind of negate the boredom and the, the kind of narrow experience that was allowed to people unless they made their own entertainment at that time there was, there was fuck all else to do you know really because you because like we said a minute ago you've grown up in the 60s and the kinks well that was great yeah. small faces very key bands yeah did, did you feel that it was kind of over that thing you know where you had bands who were singing directly about a life yeah life? yeah yeah i felt i you know i very much felt um as a kid that those bands you know as a 10 year old 12 year old that these bands were singing to me, they were my, I was their audience. You know, you, and other young London kids in the, initially were the audience for the Kinks and Small Faces and the Stones to an extent. And um, it was very exciting because every week there'd be a new single that kind of The Who was another band um, would kind of top what had been done the week before. But you felt that they were very much fight, you know, finding ways to allow you to reassess your own potential as a human being and, and see your life in a way that wasn't run out of what school teachers thought or parents, that you could create your own world through this music and a way of understanding the world, which I felt sad that I was too young to really fully inhabit, you know. So when punk came along, that was just like a second bite of the cherry and, uh, you know, I, I still think that the Kinks were a kind of punk band in, in all but name, amongst many other things, but the attitude was... Mm. Oh, definitely acknowledged by everybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you can see the lineage, it's perfect. Isn't it? Yeah. And, and, well, and, Iggy Pop started singing You Really Got Me, you know, so... Mm. Mm. And, and, and the style thing as well, which is really important as well, because the, the Kinks had a great look as well, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. And, and the yeah. songs are very visual as well, aren't they? Well, yeah, the songs are, 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 are such a range of things, aren't they, from kind of totally visceral you know, explosive guitar to, I was like Pete Quave saying, I'm in the band with Noel Coward and Jimi Hendrix. You know, yeah, I mean, how yeah. did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> so. A lot of strange tensions, obviously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, did that appeal to you as well? Um, the songs, the visual nature of their songs? I just loved everything about them. I, um, I, you know, I heard you really got me on a fucking crystal set under my sheets, you know, and it took my ears off. It was mm. like a, you know, they talk about dirty nuclear bombs. <laughs> and it was like something like that. Because it, it sounded deranged and sounded like the guy's so sick, almost lovesick, but like mentally deranged in love so much that he has to create this, this sound to, 
express it, you know. It wasn't a kind of happy June and moon type love song. It was a kind of anger, um, angst, you know, just... And it invented heavy metal or whatever. It launched the whole nightmare. It's of a game changer, isn't it? 60s yeah. guitar rock. But um, so that's one end of the spectrum. But the other end is, you know, these incredible social observation songs um, that, uh, that just saw English society, you know, the class nature of it and the eccentricity of it. And, and there are a lot of things about being English that no one has distilled in such a you know, clever and devastatingly honest way as the Kinks, and um, and 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 there were coded, you know, messages in all their songs that I was telling Matt. Actually, it's a nice story that Ray told me. That, you know, tired of waiting, they'd had these two really guitar mega hits with "You Really Got Me" and "All Day and All the Night," and then they wanted a third single that the record company wanted a slightly different sound and, and Ray had written this song based around a riff as a 15 year old when Yuri Gagarin was I think he was on the roof maybe eight, 18 year old or something on the roof um, on a frosty night he was sitting up on the roof in Muswell Hill watching Yuri Gagarin go around anyway he wrote this riff um, and they played it and it sounded great, but they didn't have any lyrics. So they, they were in the studio, they recorded the kind of backing track, but there was no lyrics. So he had to make up the lyrics on the spot. And uh, it was tired of waiting. And it was the week that Churchill was dying. So tired of waiting is about waiting for Churchill to die. Oh, wow, I never knew that. Not yeah. many people do, but yeah. I mean, whether it's true, because he, he makes up a load of shit, but <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great story. And yeah. I believe that those songs, you know, all those songs were mm. deeply meanings. political on a lot of levels. That and personal as well. Personal, like two political, sisters. yeah. Well, that's an amazing lyric, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's also about, you know, transgender. Yeah, it's about mm. a, lot of, a lot of things, as well as about Ray and Dave. You know, I think the songs work on so many levels, which is the kind of magic of their songs, which I think is more complex than in other 60s bands, you know. So they're kind of underrated still, even though, you know, mm. they're certainly more layered in terms of what, what the meaning of the song is than the Stones, I would think, you know. So and for you, is it, is it, at this point in time, you, the visual aspects of these songs, I'm just trying to get to how you become a filmmaker, is it, the King's very key to this, you know, this, this thing about storytelling, you know, that it's pop culture, but it's, they're almost like little films that each song Yeah, like. yeah, I, I guess that, that, that is probably a connection. I mean, I, I, you know, I love the, the hunting jackets. <laughs> I mean, that seemed a major piss take, you know. Mm. Well, the stuff. class thing they're always playing. Class with, thing, they? yeah, yeah and, and it launched that whole, you know, fashion for military, you know, kind of weird medals and, mm. but the Kinks were the first ones to, you know, you say you want to, you know, management and record companies say, we need you in a uniform, you know, like the Shadows or the early Beatles. And so you want a fucking uniform. <laughs> Here it is. You know? <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's great. So, yeah, I mean, you know, the best pop songs make you, you know, imagine scenarios around them, I think. You know, I, I love the fact that everyone should have their own kind of idea of what a song is and, and often that is a visual thing as well as everything else that a song can evoke you know and would, would this inspire you in early on to think in terms of filmmaking or were you trying to make music initially or or what kind of arts um weirdly i had a band called the bombers at school which was in 69 or something way before punk um where we i i, I was a really bad saxophone player thinking I could be John Coltrane or something. but um, That's quite a big jump. <laughs> not achieving my goal. Um, so I did mess around with, with playing in really bad bands, but good name, Bombers. Mm. So I did not know, the time of the IRA and all that. Um, but, and we did bomb. <laughs> yeah. So it works at two levels. Self-prophetic. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, I was more interested in art and um, literature, really, than, than being a musician. And actually, I was really interested in architecture. I, I went and studied architecture for a while before I 
thought I'm never going to be able to build what I would like to build, so I might as well make films, and then I could build sets however I want. That's how I got into wanting really? to make it's films. Really, it's very practical yeah. way of getting into it. Yeah, yeah weird. <laughs> but I always, you know, loved music from a, being a kid you know, in London. It was a great place to get into music, you know, at that time. So after, after the Pistols thing, you started filming the early gigs. So at that point, you're one of the very, very, probably the only person who's got the archive. And does that kind of lead you to a position where you can start making very early, the very early films with them? Because you actually... Well, I stuff. got, you know, Malcolm in the end, um, you know, as, as the thing blew up, um, you know, it, it became clear that we should document it as, as well as we could. So I would... He, he started employing me. He paid me more than he paid the band, I think. 12 quid a week. Yeah, generous. Yeah. Generous, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and I had to record them when they were on TV, which wasn't that often. But, you know, film whenever they played, which also was a, not as often as it could have been. Um, and when they were banned, we made these little films to, to show the band when they couldn't play. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I, um, I got involved. And I was working with Jamie. Um, at that time, um, and uh, you know when Malcolm went through, you know it was weird actually. Ken Loach, I was going to do it. All these people were going to do the P Pistols film, and and and, and Russ Mayer ended up beginning it. I was Russ Mayer's assistant director. What was that like? Actually, that was hilarious. Yeah, did he? Um, he didn't really. Did he have a grip on what they're about? He never heard of them, had he? No, I had to take him to like the Roxy and the Vortex, show him what you know punkettes look like, and he's like, "They got no fucking tits." <laughs> I can't shoot. You know, like, he's coming from a very different world, then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, um, that was hilarious, um, and that's one thing I always loved about John when, because they hated the idea of Russ Mayer um, filming them, and um, I remember. Russ Mayer, um, he had this girlfriend called Kitten, who had these huge tits. Like he, was, he was casting, he was meeting the band, and she was kind of slithering all over him while he was sitting there. Um, weird scene. But anyway, he, he was supposed to meet John, but he was also casting people for the film. And, and then came this hippie, really long hair, platform boots, big flares. Not really out of it, and <laughs> it was John. <laughs> I thought you were a fucking punk. You're a fucking hippie, <laughs> which is hilarious. He couldn't handle it. it was like, <laughs> and he called Malcolm Hitler. Where's Hitler today? So he was never going to get off and the ground. He, yeah. And when he said action, it was action. As loud like as that. Korean War. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he had his old sound guy from the Korean War. I think he'd been in you know combat as a. Yeah, so, news cameraman. It's quite a cultural chasm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was hilarious. And they had that guy Roger Ebert, you know, two thumbs up. Yeah, he's dead now, unfortunately. But um, <clears throat> writing the script, and they'd lock him in, and there'd be two hookers waiting. He said, he must be saying, "I got the ladies here for you. You got to do those fifty pages." <laughs> <laughs> and he'd come out, and they have his reward would be these two hookers in Chalk Farm. Actually, bizarre. And this is your introduction to big time filmmaking how it is yeah, yeah. and then uh, then he shot the deer you know or he didn't but he mm. said action and the guy shot the deer in Windsor Park and yeah then the film imploded you know and um, uh, it's funny and what was it like working in that kind of situation not with him but with McLaren was it McLaren very hands-on or did he <clears throat> well you'll talk to a lot of people have you know different takes on Malcolm um, Jamie as well um, he was. We wrote the script. You know, to, it was a very intense period of him coming around to my flat. And we, we, when he decided that, you know, well, I persuaded him that we got all this documentary stuff that we could make a different kind of film. It didn't have to be a fictional narrative. It could be about the band. And um, he, he then got into this, uh, you know, kind of. This, this Svengali thing, how I put the band together mm. and so on. So we, you know, we wrote it as a piss take, basically. Um, and then, uh, then Mizali 
you know, he'd let you do it, he'd just get on with it. But then he would suddenly say, right, you're no longer on it. I'm going to bring someone else in. To oh, so it's very, it. like, very chaotic. It was, it was, yeah. and, and the band were getting, you know, John and he had fallen out when, mm. when we were making that. John wanted nothing to do with the film at that point. Uh, uh, so, I, you know, I, I, I have a very mixed kind of feeling about my relationship with with Malcolm, it was incredibly stimulating and catalytic for me, um, creatively. <clears throat> and um, then very sour when he tried to fire you, <laughs> having put in all the time. Um, he also treated Jamie really badly at the end. You know, he'd ignore you. We'd have these meetings about what, the, what ideas people had for the band. And, uh, you know, at certain times he, he would be really, you know, Discourteous, I'd say, to Jamie. You know, so um, you just lose interest in people. Or? I don't know. It's a lot about him, obviously, mm. um, which is why he and John didn't really mm. see eye to eye because, in a sense, they were quite similar. In they they do. Ways. They talk very similar, don't they? Yeah, yeah and both great in their own way, mm. you know. But both, I'd say, difficult and not. Malcolm's not his biggest route wasn't loyalty to people. It was you know throwing it out and moving on, which. You know, is, is can work, can, but it's not good for good, but relationships, it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. so you know, I, I, I certainly will cherish the fact that um, I learned a lot from him, and I think I saw the best, some of the best times of him. You know, I, I loved him in '76. It got weirder and weirder during '77, mm -hmm. and, and then by the by the '90s, I couldn't really understand how he believed this thing that we made up, you know, that it, the band couldn't play and the band were morons that he, you know, moulded out of putty. Mm. And I guess that's the thing that it. we'd completely yeah. seen as, you know, kind of turning in. Well, it was inspired by F for Fake, which is um, Orson Welles' film, where you create a, a fake story of the band it's very fake news, um, in order to get people to question why the fuck they're worshipping this band that they were supposed to... Which is a brilliant idea. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a cool idea, but the, then that Malcolm would believe it was true yeah. was quite astonishing to me, because we had a lot of fun playing around with how to construct this, this fabrication, you know. <clears throat> it's fair to say that film kind of sets your template of filmmaking. You know, it's, it's, it's got a lot of cultural context, it goes off a lot of tangents, yeah. It's got loads of other bits of footage. It's, it's complex, isn't it? And it's, a, it's almost like a bricolage of yeah, ideas, yeah, yeah. Good. which is very punk rock as well, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, and it was very, very homemade. You know, um, there was bits of money, so we'd have a big camera like that one mm. week, and then um, next week, you know, Super 8, and then uh, VHS. Some of it was shot on. So, you know, it had a kind of patchwork quilt, quite anarchic texture to it which I really liked, you know. Um, then I got some friends who were at film school to do some cartoons, which the, the, the idea of making a cartoon out of a sex pistol was kind of sacrilege, you know, like these guys are rebel, you know, too cool for school. Yeah. You can't reduce them to a That's some of the best parts of the film. I'll fucking kneecap yeah. you if you do <laughs> type thing. Um, but yeah, no, now you have bands like Gorillaz who are, you know, cartoons, so it's funny how how things go around. Well, it's the thing about that film, it's such a densely packed uh, pile of ideas. There's so many little things to be untied. Yeah. I mean, would you, when you watch it back, do you, I mean, do you watch it back in years, decades later? Well, I've seen it in ways. with audiences, yeah. Yeah. Time, so, yeah. I mean, we had great fucking screenings at the time, you know. Um, you know, we had, I, I, with Jamie, we went to Paris and um, showed, um, it was the Rex, big Art Deco cinema, biggest cinema in Paris, and full of punks. And they got into the projection booth and ripped the projector off the bolts <laughs> in the floor and were hand holding it. So the film was playing on the audience, on the, on the <laughs> yeah, ceiling. Yeah, yeah. And what a great way to watch the rock and roll film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Handheld. It's almost like a scene out of the rock and roll film. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. Um, and then in Hamburg, we had a, we had a scene where during my way, some kid, punk kid, got up on under the screen and, and put lighter fuel along the bottom of the screen, lit it during my way. So a massive evacuation of Sid is singing going up in wow. 
Did flames. You, Hamburg, that's where you're going. Did you film it at all? <laughs> no. It would have been a great thing to film. I, I know. Almost and then, and then, and then yeah. the last, yeah, there was one in the Chelsea Classic, it was called at the time, where, um, which is more, you know, upmarket kind of screening of the middle aged characters. And uh, some kid looking exactly like Sid, Tulkham hair and white dinner jacket and boots, jumped up in front of the screen and pulled out a gun and started shooting the audience, you know, yeah. as he was doing it on the screen with blanks, but the, the whole cinema like screaming, like <laughs> terror attack. They're really you know. going to do this. <laughs> so that's, those are the screenings I remember. That, which parts you know, it was you a provocation. You know. Which parts you enjoyed most making that film? Those kind of set pieces. Surviving, because you know, Malcolm repeatedly fired me, you know. Yeah, yeah. But he had to <laughs> ask you back though, didn't he? He did. He asked me back as a slave in the cutting room. I was supposed to bring him material without opening my mouth. <clears throat> oh, so he actually in the end thought he was the person no, then, the film. No, then, then he went bust and the receivers said, you've got to finish this film because no one else can. And so I was, I was back in, I did finish it and, um, yeah. I mean, a lot of the films you made for about that period since then, have they been an attempt to try and retell the story or just balance the story out? No, the only one, The Filth and the Fury. Or the even The Pistols in Huddersfield, which you think? Uh, I suppose, no, that was more like, you know, that was such a weird ending to the, to the band in England. I, I didn't feel, I think I'd done the rebalancing with The Filth and the Fury. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, to me, the Huddersfield thing was something different. But uh, I like making films about the same thing in different ways. You know, I think I've done seven or eight films about them now. So yeah, yeah. I would, <clears throat> maybe there's a death bed. They're very different films, aren't they? I mean, Filth and Fury is very, very human. It's quite yeah. emotional watching it. And it's yeah, very yeah. personal. Yeah. It's, it's actually the real people who are caught in this weird situation. Well, I was, as I say, I was annoyed seeing Malcolm saying that they were nothing and, um, you know, he created everything about them. Every breath they took was kind of him squeezing mm. <laughs> the concertina yeah. or something. And uh, that was completely wrong because they did come out of a time and a place and a life of their own that created that music, not him, you know. And that's something else that fascinates you as well, the context, the story, the bigger story, isn't it? Why, why is this thing happening? Why is it here? And, and you do that in a lot of your films, don't you? Sometimes you do it with the, the interviews, which are great in Phil from the Fury. And sometimes you do it with the expansion of those things. You do Rock and Roll Swindle, which is like the little clips, the random. Mm. They seem like random, but the library clips... So, do you want to explain that? that uh, yeah, I like uh, I like treating it as kind of chance, really. That what you put together isn't you don't sit down and write. I'd like to find you know a sparrow sitting on a <laughs> clothes peg or whatever you know to fit <laughs> this hole. You you you're more random than that. You you know when I did uh, the Filth and the Fury, I re I remembered the pistols gave me a. Um, a video machine, which was really rare. It was one of the first, like, the magic objects to record them off TV. Um, and I think I spent all my 12, more than my 12 pounds a week on the, it was like 25 quid for a, an hour tape, you know, it was crazy. But I spent all my money on, on recording movies off TV. So when I did The Filth and Fury, I had this bank of loads of VHS tapes of like, Brigadoon and, um, you know, um, whatever, um, 40 guns and stuff like that anyway. But uh, and then I thought, well, there must be, because there were some of them are three hour tapes. So it was just like recording what was on TV either side of this movie. <clears throat> so basically, you know, just whiz through these and find moments that could just spark off what you were doing. So, so it's, it's very it's, random. Yeah. You know. very, and it's a very instinctive process. As soon as something uh, connects, you think that's got to, that's going to go in. Or yeah, what? yeah, yeah. I, I like that way of uh, working with archive. And it's interesting because it feeds back as that sort of collage thing, which is very much part of punk, very much part of 70s kind of art school yeah. as well. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think, we're, you know, I'd be lying to say that we came up with the idea of the collage um, approach. It was, you know, it was money that meant we were shooting on Super 8 and then putting it next mm. to... It was just any way you could tell the story with what was available at the time. But it did seem to me that it, it reflected a kind of punk sensibility, taking different formats and different pieces. And you, when you didn't have something that was perfect, you, you'd grab something else and, you know, kind of force it to work. 
Mm, so in effect, rock and roll swindle, the, it kind of tells you everything about punk, apart from the story itself. It's just the way it's made. Mm. It's, it's the art of punk, mm. that thing of different images, different quality of film, yeah. lo-fi, hi-fi, whatever. Bang it all together, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and it's, it's actually the experience of watching it visually that's actually the, the real story there. I think also you, it's something nice about um, leaving people a little... Um, it's almost like you need to watch it again, maybe sometimes, <clears throat> so that it doesn't give everything out in one go. You know, it's not literally telling a story. It's, it's kind of colliding things more obliquely, which, are, you, you know, then you get a third meaning from what you're actually getting out of the two things you smash together. And it can even fragment into more meanings, which I, I like, that kind of layering of um, what, a, what a film can, can say over time, you know. Do you think for a lot of people they just wanted it to be like one hour of the band play? <laughs> Probably, yeah. No, no, I'm like, yeah. Well, it, you know, we we had the slogan, the film that incriminates its audience. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. meant to play. It was like a red rag to a bull for the audience. Again, you know? deliberately. Deliberately, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very punk attitude yeah. in a way. <clears throat> so at that point in time, do you think this, that, that I'm set now as somebody's going to make these kind of, sort of, sort of quite left field pop culture films or... Well, uh, no, I, you know, I just want to make films um, and video, you know, it was the beginning of music video. Mm, yeah, I, was I was just wondering why, why would because it's a very different discipline. You've got to get the whole story to three minutes. There's not a lot of space yeah. to mess around in a video, is there? No, but, you know, you can always cut to the drummer if something goes wrong, <laughs> or you could in those days. Um, so it was, you know, it was a great laboratory to try out stuff and... Um, but initially, you know, I'd go, I'd go into record companies having done the Rock and Roll Swindle and um, I, I think like, which is ridiculous because it was me, but the, the, um, the, the idea that someone who'd worked with the sex business, they're like, shit, is he going to shit on the carpet? What's he going to do? <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. to like, get this guy out, you know. So I didn't really get to, uh, you know, uh, very beginning, I, it was hard for me to get, I had to do a Judas Priest video and stuff like that, you know. I did, so, who I thought were a comedy band. Um, yeah. To just to get in the door, you know. <clears throat> so you were deliberately seeking out working in video? Because, was it a practical thing? Well, it was or? a way of surviving because uh, yeah. you weren't allowed really to make films uh, as a young kid at that time. You know, I, I, and I directed by hook or by crook the Rock and Roll Swindle. So I wanted to direct another film, but it wasn't that easy. Now, it, now unless you're a first time film director, it's, <laughs> It's hard, you know, and then they get the next one in. It's mm. kind of like a conveyor belt, boy band type approach to film directing. But um, yeah, at that time it was it was hard to get a get a film off the ground. Uh, what kind of ideas did you that. have? So yeah. video was a way of keeping working, you know. Um, what were the films you really wanted to make at that point? Time? Yeah, yeah, I had a I had a film called Hole in the Middle, which was about piracy, record piracy. It was had a great enforcer, a guy called Robert Service, who, the whole in the early, he used to put the people's hands in the record pressing thing and get the puncture of the hand with the, you know, like the hole in the middle of the record. That's a pretty good first scene, but it can score so easy almost, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, so I didn't get to make that one. Um, was it kind of a pro piracy film? Yeah. So he's feeding to the Bow Wow Wow thing? Or? Well, it had beautiful scenes. It was about piracy. It was record piracy, but it was, it was people, you know, it, it, FBI trying to stop it and so on, but, uh, but great scenes of everyone destroying all the consumer products, mm. and hammering Rolex watches into smithereens <laughs> yeah, yeah. and stuff, because <laughs> they were supposedly pirate <coughs> versions, yeah. you know. And that's a, also an interesting extension of Rock and Roll Swindle, isn't it? It's like what is real, what is fake, what is. Yeah, yeah. But it was, you know, it was a, it, you know, it's kind of slightly inspired by people like Don Siegel and stuff, you know, like Robert Mitchum. We wanted him to be. This service guy, you know, mm. <laughs> like busting punk managers. Did, did you find making videos? I mean, obviously, it's, it's great, it's good living, and, and you can make great videos. Did you find it frustrating you couldn't get all these other sort of stories and nuances and messages in there? No, I like uh, in the early days of video, they didn't know what the fuck you were doing. So, so you could get all that stuff. It was like in, a yeah. diary for me, yeah. personal diary. I think a lot of my. Well, you know, I was banned a lot with my videos, so yeah. it's a badge of honour, isn't it? <clears throat> um, no, I got away with a lot of stuff, which you wouldn't get away with now, you know. Like, um, 
you know, the big one, with the Stones one called Undercover of the Night, which was kind of about El Salvador at the time. There was this war, death squads, and you know, same same thing going on now, really. But um, bizarrely, they'd written a song about that, or Mick had written the lyrics about that. So um, it was um, it was great to. In fact, it was during the revolution in Grenada, 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 Grenada. 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 Yeah. Grenada. TV. Grenada's yeah. the TV station. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next up. Anyway, um, I tried to persuade them in the middle of the revolution to get the stones into Grenada because I'd seen, you know, I was there and um, I kept seeing these CIA guys on, you know, lying on in their swimsuits with guns, you know, it's like bizarre, the coup was about to happen. And so I wrote the song kind of based around that and tried to get them to Grenada, thinking as a punk that I shouldn't work with the Rolling Stones, you know, jet set trash. Yeah. Um, so I'll write something they will never film, you know, they'll say no. called you bluff. I could get yeah. out of it gracefully, you know, because yeah. uh, my partner was like, you've got to do the Rolling Stones. So I wrote this very extreme thing where Keith, executes Mick um, in Grenada. Anyway, little, they said, yeah. we're not doing it in Grenada, but we will do it. I was like, wow, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> so we had to go to Mexico and do it. But then it got banned. Uh, I don't know, for what? Violence, politics, I don't know. It doesn't matter, really. I think it was for the gun, wasn't it, if I remember from reading about it? It would be the gun. I think it was more than just the gun. It, they didn't like the idea of politics in music videos yeah. in general. So what was it actually like working the Stones? Was this, was this a different kind of world? Was it very controlled or was it...? Um, well, it was different for me because they were childhood like heroes of mine. So it was like meeting, you know, mm -hmm. mythic stars. Um, but I was surprised how down to earth they were, particularly Keith and even, even the others. Um, it was a funny time to work with him because Keith had been, you know, kind of out of it for 10 years and he was just coming back saying, it's my band. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's a weird tension going on. That's where the idea, yeah, came from, you know, that, that, that they, they really didn't get on at that point. Um, <clears throat> but I did enjoy working with them and I was very surprised how, um, how willing to take risks and, you know, stuff and I've always I, I, I've liked them ever since I love Keith particularly. yeah you maintained oh yeah I made a film with him a couple yeah. of years ago and what was it what was the older Keith like to work with compared to the younger Keith just the same great <clears throat> down to earth he's quite a different character in real life I believe he's, he's very well read he's, he's not yeah, 24 yeah. hour rock and roll like the, the tabloid image that goes in front of him no I think it was always a bit of a thing of you know trying to get out of the fame madness you know, the drug thing wasn't um, showing off or kind of out. It was quite protective with him. Um, he's certainly, um, yeah, a very bright guy and, and well read and, um, you know, very sure of who he is and down, down to earth, I'd mm. say. You know, he's great. Just a great interviews. Uh, yeah, I did that whole weekend thing with him and I did a film about his childhood, which uh, I, I like. Mm. Story that's a really great story as well, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Again, uh, adding the context for you. Yeah, yeah that post-war Britain you know, that they want to take us back to, it seems like. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is, uh, yeah, it's fascinating to me. It's just before I'm conscious of things, but I love that, that, that whole period after the war. So um, in a sense, I mean, obviously it's just before your time, but is that, are you trying to... When you make a film like that and you're doing key stories, is there quite a lot of you in there as well, trying to explain where you come from, why you do this? And well, there is, you know, I wouldn't want to be the guy with the headphones, you know, Nick Brimfield, whatever, you know, yeah, yeah. getting me in the shot I mean, yeah. you can. I, I wouldn't recommend that, or but I mean, you can't things. avoid it. You know, I yeah, did a yeah. film about Joe Strummer and, uh, you know, I was born in the same year as Joe and I did a lot of moves. Obviously, we were totally different, very different. But, you know, when the turning of the road comes and you cut your hair, it's to do with reasons that are similar, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you can't avoid... I mean, I, 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 in, in some ways, the films that I do are more about trying to draw a map of uh, post-war, subcultural Britain than anything else. I'm, I'm not that interested in telling the story of a rock band, really. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I do find them you know, the very interesting windows into the period of time that I've lived through and why people loved the music at that point so much, why the guys wrote it. Um, Using the, the, these, these great characters as conduits. Yeah, it's a great window into the time you've lived through, I think, you know, and I hope they, you know, they are social histories and documents as much as kind of rockumentaries about a band, you know. Yeah, which is, um, I don't like yeah. the phrase rockumentary because it it's seems boring. like a record company yeah. endorsed thing, you know, where you've got these guys sitting around the old mixing desk saying, oh, well, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. he spilt beer in that, on that trap, do you remember? You know, like, and it's the same story, <laughs> isn't it? Same, Form, fucking same, same, old, same second arm, third arm, split up. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's boring. Replicates mm. over and over. So yeah. That's what I like about the, the films you do. They do bring the whole story in, the, the colouring. The, why, why is this thing here? Why did it happen? Why did we all love it? Yeah. yeah. What was it like working with Joe? You, you were quite close to Joe's drummer, weren't you? You've got lots of friends. Well, I was, um, and I wasn't. I wasn't for, 20, for you know, I, again, when, um, well, I lived in, around here in squats at the same time as Joe, when he was in the 101ers, and he was the kind of squat band, you know. So he was, um, he was a real hippie, and, mm. you know, communal band. And we, in our squad, we were all into Roxy music, so it was like, well, we don't you write hippies squad. anymore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. So, um, and then I, then I got involved with the Pistols, and I was on Oxford Street, and I saw him outside the 100 Club with, like, really overdosed blonde, mm. like, and it always reminded me of Marlon Brando and Julius Caesar, like, too, too much peroxide, didn't it? And was like, how can that guy, how's he going to be a punk? He can't be a punk, he's a hippie. Oh, did he seem that weird, the jump? Yeah, it seemed very weird, because like two weeks yeah. before, he'd been, it seemed like a hippie. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, downstairs he was tuning into the IRA. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it was fucking brilliant. Yeah. So he obviously could do it. Um, and I thought, well, I've got to film these guys too, it's amazing. And so I did film The Clash, as well as The Pistols for a while, and... Um, and then Bernie Rhodes said, it's us or them, you can't film both. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah, yeah. The big schism. Uh, yeah, yeah, so well, I'll stick with the pistols then. Because <laughs> I didn't like Bernie very much. <clears throat> He's a difficult person. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, so, but then the band, I think, were told I'd walked or something. So for 25 years, I, you know, <laughs> me and Joe Strummer were like... Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. You know, have, if you're having a piss in some in the Roseland or something, you know bad, weird vibe, and there's Joe having a piss. Like, <laughs> so, so how did you cross It was the very weird how I did, um, did get to know him on another level as um, my wife's best friend at school, uh, this was in the mid-90s, said, oh, she wants to come and she's looking for somewhere to live, come and I'm from Somerset, live in Somerset. and. Um, so they want to come and see if they're you know, looking for a house. Can they stay? I said, fine. She's coming with her boyfriend, new boyfriend. <laughs> anyway, I'm summer's day. I've got this hot air balloon trying to build this for my kids, very young kids at the time. And um, big thing, you know, I couldn't really work out how to do it. So I'm, the wind's blowing all the bits of paper around and, and they turn up and, and loose cinder comes in and there's this guy behind him. I'm like, fuck he looks like Joe Strummer. <laughs> Can't be Joe Strummer. <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah shit, it is Joe Strummer. I'm like, oh glare, glare, glare. Oh, he's you know, pretty it's like, awkward. It's yeah. Like yeah. Turning, get yeah. back in the car and walk off. But you know, my wife and Loose were like hugging and but, so he he kind of stayed begrudgingly for the, a little bit and uh he, he, he saw me doing, and he said, yeah, you, you're making a mess of that, aren't you? I'll, I'll help you, show you how to do it, kind of thing, which, which he didn't know, but... <laughs> so we were both working on this hot air balloon, not getting very far, you know. So we started having a drink, and then, then it started getting dark, and we were, you know, making progress, and then we had a fire. Oh, no, so there has to and be then, a fire And somewhere. then we had yeah. to finish the thing, yeah. you know, the dawn came up, and a um, beautiful dawn, you know, rosy pink dawn, mm -hmm. all birds chirping. He said, all right, let's fire it up, let's fire her up. Big fucking thing, so he lit it. Oh, no, he said, wake up the kids, wake up the kids. It's like four in the morning in the summer. Okay, we wake them up, they're like, oh, what's going on, Dad? And they're leaning out of the window, and he said, like, light her, light her. 
it goes up in the air, this majestic um, <laughs> ascent of this hot air balloon. And then suddenly it catches fire. It's like this huge fireball in the sky. And Joe's like, yes, this is it. I want to live here forever. You know, like hugging me. <laughs> like, so he bought a farmhouse next door, you know. So Oh, so I forgot that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so um, yeah. you know, I got to know him in a completely different way, you know, mm-hmm. for the last six or seven years of his life, you know, which was, was amazing, yeah. Got the time when he's back out on the road again. And well, it was a time where he was putting that Mescaleros project together and then going back out, yeah. Mm. Getting back in touch with himself, it felt like. Yeah, getting some kind of confidence back. He was, he was weird when I first met him. It was like, I mm, don't know what I'll do. Maybe I'll be a cab driver, you know, like, mm. seriously. It's like, no, Joe, you should be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> shouldn't think like that kind of thing. And everyone was saying, you know, come on, Joe, get back on the horse. Every time you know. I met him, he always said he was worried that nobody's ever going to go and see him when he did a gig, which is kind yeah, of Yeah, like, it was yeah. weird, yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I, I got to really love, love the guy on, on another level, you know. Mm. And, Nothing and, about the music or anything. And a great film as well. Yeah, yeah, hard film for me to make because, um, you know, it's kind of second... I wouldn't have made a film about him if he was alive and, and I didn't... I, you know, people saying you should do something about Joe and, and I, yeah. But it's difficult because, you know, second-guessing someone you you know pretty well and um, yeah it's hard because you you know you probably fucking hate it <laughs> <Anyway. laughs> I, I thought the I mean the fire motive was great really beautiful things used all the way through and using different people with a fire was such a cool thing yeah P- probably quite simple but a very nice link to make it all work. yeah yeah well you know we used to, he used to have these fires you know you'd you'd have a fire you'd go there you know we well, did it at my place as well, but you'd have a fire on Friday and it would finish on Sunday. Mm. I'm like, fucking hell, I <laughs> yeah, yeah. survive this one. And on Tuesday, Joe would say, should we have a fire? <laughs> should go next door and have a fire. <laughs> have a fire at your place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> you weren't there that time that Bez chopped the 16th century tree down. Yeah, I was. Oh, was it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the listed blue plaque tree. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, you know, the other thing was great meeting so many people met through Joe around those fires that, mm. you know, very different types of people. And that was great, you know, it was a kind of, it was a kind of project, you know, of Joe's, he'd make everyone comfortable and look after them and make sure they kind of listened to each other and learned from each other around the fire. Mm. It was great. In a way, <clears throat> back to the, almost a hippie thing. And a cool yeah, one, I mean, you know, he was course. putting his life back together, you know, because he, he's, he, he, <laughs> You know, I think he did come on strong with the street punk, you know, yeah. cockney, mockney kind of thing. So he was kind of relaxing back into, you know, who he the was. He was a hippie, but yeah. he was he was always a kind of rebel hippie. You know, he was great. He had a brilliant way of bringing different tribes together, partly because he'd been these various mm. different and, types and the, of people. You know. And the similarities are glaring, are they? After you look back decades later. Yeah, that's, you know, the perspective, hindsight, you realise, you know, the hippie thing was the rebellion of the late 60s mm. and the punk mm. thing was just carrying it on and had to kill its father. Just find its space to exist, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. Do you think the punk thing, because the intensity of it is quite damaging to a lot of people, you know, like, like Joe and something, because he had that decades of trying to find himself again. Obviously, to Sid, that was pretty damaging. But to all the people at that time, to, and, and to, maybe with the films you're making, do you think it's a way of people trying to understand that really short and intense period? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I, th- you know, I think people were putting their lives on the line, and really, at that point, in, in, a, in a way that I think it's hard for people to conceive of now. It was very, very intense, the punk thing. It was great. Um, uh, I might make a film about Shane McGowan, so, you know, I also think he was very... You know, he had to push to the edge to, to kind of break through in, in what he had to say, you know. If you didn't go to the edge, you couldn't kind of say it. Yeah, that was a key phrase. The two key phrases, people always describe things, how intense they were, and go, getting the edge, one of that was <laughs> damaging, yeah. but great art, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, do you think the punk period as well, now we look back on it, it's a very English thing, isn't it? And I think... And I was thinking this before we talk about Russ Mayer making the rock and roll swindle form. What a bad mistake. It's American, California. It's not 
that co- not to cover it, don't understand yeah. the damp melancholy in this country. It doesn't make him a bad director, but I think you have to understand English culture. I think a lot of your films, they, they do, they're very English, aren't they? You know, Ibiza is very, I know it's a Spanish island. It's very English. But but Paul Oakenpel thinks it's British. <laughs> <laughs> but the stories, it's so part. He invented it. It's very much part of, of English culture, isn't it? You know, even though it is, yeah, 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 no. No, I'm, you know, I'm very, Eng- I'm, I'm English, you know, I can't get away from English. Um, but, uh, which I'm, you know, I'm, I think Englishness has a great, great rebel tradition as well, you know, so the right kind of Englishness. Mm, mm. Um, I bet it's not celebrated enough, really. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a kind of odd mixture because I am obviously middle class, you know, and I don't, I've never tried to hide that, but I did grow up being in a very working class, you know, mm. environment, but my father was a, he, you know, he, he'd chosen to live in a, in that way, because he's is. a communist. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. So he, he was like, he was, he was down with the people. And was, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, he liked his Beethoven, which he liked to blast out, which the other people on the estate <laughs> didn't appreciate. <laughs> so there'd be a few dog turds through the uh, letterbox, <laughs> stuff like that. But you know, was, I was growing up with with very working class kids, so I do have a an understanding of that side of our culture and, mm-hmm. and kind of how it worked, you know, in a way. And is it, are a lot of the films for you, maybe subconsciously trying to find this. It's so full of contradictions. This country, and are, are the films trying to explain this, unravel this? I, I this? think they're fascinated by it. You know, um, I, you know. I think there's always been many types of Englishness. You know, it, 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 the cliches of it are one thing, but you know, uh, I've always liked the um, the kind of rebelliousness of English poets and. You know whether it's Marlowe or Byron or Oscar Wilde, um, Irish. Um, you know, I, I've always been very Coleridge. Um, you know, I've made films about some of those people too, and um, that rebel Englishness is a very powerful thing, as well as the kind of cliche of empire and upper class, repressive, emotionally repressed, and punk to me is part of that tradition. You know. Mm. It's weird, it has become part of the history now, and it? it's not, it's not yeah. even pop culture anymore, it's actually something you read in a history book. Well, it's a way of thinking, you know, which is, is interesting. Yeah. So when you make a film about someone like Wilco, do you see him in a, in a weird way, in that kind of tradition of people like Coleridge or whatever, you know, like... Yeah, definitely, with Wilco. I mean, I, you know, I got on really well with Wilco because we shared a, a kind of literary mm. side. He, he is deeply interested in, in literature, you know, and you speak surprisingly, he doesn't look Icelandic. like it necessarily. Yeah, yeah he's nuts. You know? Yeah. And, you know, he could quote, unbelievably, he, he can quote the, the whole of Piers Plowman, which is a kind of Middle English epic. He mm. knows it all off by heart, you know, which is insane. Yeah. Uh, but great, to me, anyway. <clears throat> yeah, because that's, to me, the fascinating thing about him is how he's, he's got all that, but he somehow compresses it into, like, tiny little... Like, like songs about eight words yeah, in them. Yeah, yeah, no, but, great. But, but are perfect. It's yeah, hard yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah, no, he's yeah. a great songwriter. No, he's a one off. He's brilliant to sing, Wilco Johnson. And thank God he's you know, still around. Cause... I mean, obviously, the film was about how he dealt with his cancer and death and things, but there's yeah. a lot of other levels working in that film as well, isn't there? Yeah. Um... Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I like the idea that you can you can love rock and roll or punk rock or just as much as you can love uh, Shakespeare, you know, mm. um, which is the case with Wilco and me. Uh, you see, you see, it's a very direct lineage, the same. Yeah, I think you know you can look at if you read Chaucer, you see, you know, in the Pardoner's Tale, there's this group of, you know. Reprobate musicians who are vomiting and farting and <laughs> you know smashing it around the uh, ale houses, very like the Pistols, you know. Um, and you look at Marlowe, who you know was killed um, by the Secret Service with a dagger through his eye. He he inhabited the the streets and the and palaces of the kingdom, and he put the two languages together to create what Shakespeare then went on to, you know, immortalise in a way. So, you know, you, know, you look at these things and, um, 
you know, they come from an understanding of all the elements of a world that you live in, you know, rather than just being blinkered in one world. <coughs> and I like putting yeah. those together or analysing things from different parts of that spectrum, you know. And is that, do you think that's the core of your filmmaking, that, that basic idea? I don't know. I mean, it's certainly, you know, I, I would hope that's part of the dynamic of, of the films. I, I still try and believe I'm a punk film director, you know, mm. which may be pushing it a bit. Well, it depends <laughs> how you define punk, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think punk should be what you don't expect, really. Yeah. I mean, and, and also, the Glastonbury film kind of fits into this as well, because it's something very quintessentially... It feels ancient, Glastonbury. It feels like it's been there for a thousand years. The actual festival itself, I know where the round has yeah, yeah. been out for a long time. Well, I, uh, you know, I bunked off school and went to the first, well, the 1971 uh, one, the, you know, the first... The Kinks one. Did they well, the Kinks were supposed to headline the 71, which yeah. was about 2,000 people in a, in a field. I think 71 was about 10,000 people in the field, mm. <laughs> all hippies. Uh, and, you know, you walked in, it was all barefoot, and, you know, free festival. So, you know, the, the, sitting there and whenever I made that film, watching all these people come in with refrigerators and generators and washing machines and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's a different trip, you know. So, it was, it was, you know, it's using that festival as a kind of mirror of the way our culture has, you know, morphed and evolved insanely mm. over that time and the way people view themselves is well, so different well, from what it more than any of the festival is so brilliant at doing isn't it the way it does change yeah yeah, yeah. no it mirrors mirrors the, the changes in the outside world you know Without initially i thought itself. i'd you know try and show the you know passage of history around the festival but you didn't need it in the end it was all there in the way the yeah. shoes or lack of shoes or you know the objects that they held in there and it was so different, you know, it was great just to use the festival. And your current projects, you're working on the Ibiza film. And yeah. You're working on a, you about to start working on a Jamie Reid film? Well, I, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to do that. Because um, Jamie, yeah, uh, you know, I, we, we had a brief period of working quite intensely together around the pistols and, um, you know, we shared a certain perspectives that others in, in that group didn't share and I think he's been remarkably kind of consistent in that way and um, yeah I mean I just think he's a brilliant guy and a brilliant artist and uh, you know a political artist mm. which I like. Is that, is that, would that be more of a straight Sort of bio yeah, nothing going to be straight. No, I'm just trying to, wonder, I'm trying to guess yeah. how you're going to tell the story, but obviously you haven't done it yet. So, you, you know, you've got to make it up as you go along mm. to a great extent. I think that's, you know, if you think you know what you're doing, you're kidding yourself. So the story kind of almost tells itself. I think that's the way to go. You know, without a map, it's always the best. You find more interesting things on the way if you don't know exactly how you're going to get there. That's a good point to finish on. Thanks a lot, Julian. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs>